If you take your notes out this morning, we're continuing our series entitled Living Free. And this is the third installment of part C of part two of the 10 Laws of Boundaries. I'm hearing such great responses on this series on boundaries and how to live a life of freedom that comes from knowing the areas that God has given me, he's given you of ownership of, and how to live our freedom responsibly. And and loved ones, there's just no getting around this. Every difficulty that we experience comes down to boundary issues. We're having a huge boundary struggle in our culture right now. And Satan is playing the same tricks on us as humans that he played on our original parents, Adam and Eve. I want to draw this out for a minute. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, God made it very plain to Adam and Eve that he had created all of earth for them. And he placed them in this garden where all their needs were met. Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 and 17 says this. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Now the words to tend and to watch means that God designed Adam to work. Work is not a result of the fall. Productive work is a part of God's good purpose for the human race. In chapter 3, verse 1, all of a sudden, this serpent figure is suddenly introduced into the story. The fact is that the Bible says that the serpent is the shrewdest and the craftiest of any of the beasts in the field. And the serpent's first question is incredibly misleading. He lies to the first human couple concerning the boundary that God had created for them to live. Boundaries are for our freedom. They're not meant to restrict. But Satan will try to convince you that they're boring, they're inhibiting, and they will keep you enslaved, and they will keep you trapped. In verse 1b, the serpent says to Eve, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees of the garden? The answer is, of course not. In verse 16, God told him, you can eat of all the trees freely, but there's just one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must stay away from. Eve's response largely echoes God's instruction regarding the tree of knowledge, but she fails to identify the tree clearly of knowledge of good and evil, and she adds this comment. She says to the serpent, we're not allowed to touch it. She was never told that. She's making this up. Some scholars believe that Eve's Eve's minor variations are meant to convey, even at this stage, that this woman views God's instructions as open to human modification. We get into trouble when we start to modify what God has already said in his word. Eve shouldn't even have engaged the serpent. Worst yet, we're told that Adam was with her. He was not leading Eve or himself. And here's the tragedy. God had put him as the representative of the entire earth. And he just passively stood by and watched Eve become deceived. This is boundary breaking, friends, at its worst. The entire human race was placed into Satan's captivity. Look at verse 4 and 5. The serpent responds to Eve. Well, you won't die. The serpent replied to the woman, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So the serpent immediately begins to lie about God's character. God did not tell them not to eat of the tree because they're going to be more like him. The truth is they couldn't have been more like him because they were created in his image. 
The serpent not only contradicts what God has said, but he goes on to present the fruit as something that's worth obtaining. By eating it, he says, you will know God. And knowing good and evil. It's important not to overlook the irony of the serpent's remark. The couple, unlike the servant, serpent, had been made in God's image. In this way, they're already like God. <laughs> Being in his image, they are expected to exercise authority over all the beasts of the field. And this is important. That includes the serpent. By obeying the serpent, Adam and Eve transgressed the boundary that God had placed for their protection and their nurture. They actually betrayed the trust that God had placed in them. Friends, this is not merely an act of disobedience. It's an act of treachery. They were meant to govern the earth on God's behalf. Instead, they rebelled against their divine king and they obeyed one of his creatures. You can hear the herpin, the serp, herpin. <laughs> you can hear the serpent hiss as he said, you shall not surely die. If they had listened to the father of truth, those words, which are meant to be boundaries, the truth would have protected them. But the serpent was able to influence Eve to become discontent with what they were permitted to have access to. So verse 6 and 7 says this. So women, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now her perspective has been tainted. She's been deceived. And all of a sudden, this one tree stands out above all the other trees. Isn't that what forbidden things usually do? Don't forbidden things look like they're going to be better than what they really are? You look at that cream puff and you think it's full <laughs> of delectable cream and you bite into it and you just have stuff all over your face because there's nothing in it. I think sin's like that. And it was a delight to their eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave some to her husband, Key, who was with her. And he ate. The eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. When they ate, the Bible says their eyes were open. And they came to know something. But the knowledge that they discovered was because of shame and guilt, they discovered that they were naked now. They now know good and evil by experience. But the sense of guilt makes them afraid to come to God. They have become now slaves to evil. They were free. They transgressed the boundaries of God. And now this terrible thing has happened. While they did not cease to exist physically, they are expelled from the garden sanctuary. When God was saying you're going to die, he was talking about spiritual death. You're going to now be incapable of relating to me because something of my nature in you has died. Cut off from the source of life and the tree of life, they're now in the realm of the dead. What they experienced outside of Eden is not life as intended, but spiritual death. Now, boundaries are all about guarding your heart, which is your mind, your emotions, and your will. God calls your heart the control center of your life. Friend, if your heart is damaged and wounded, then your life is going to be extremely painful. And you will be out of control of your heart. This is our leading verse in this series. Would you read out loud with me? Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. Let's begin. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Heart in the book of Proverbs and in the Bible. Always refers to the control center of your inner life. And your orientation to God. From which a person does all of their thinking, all of their feeling, and all of their choosing. The reason God said even all of these trees, but not this one, he says, this is how you're going to protect your heart. Your heart's going to get damaged if you go outside this boundary. 
taking words of wisdom into our heart is vital. And wisdom present in the heart is worth guarding because he says this. It's out of your heart. It's out of your thoughts. It's out of your emotions. And it's out of your will. Notice this. He says, all of your life flows. The destiny of your life. How you will end this life. And then which life you go into in eternity has everything to do with the guarding of your heart. Does this make sense? This makes your heart central. Jesus stresses just how important your heart is. And in your relationship to God, just how important it is that we have our hearts changed by his spirit and his word. Notice what Jesus says about the heart in Luke 6, 43 to 45. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. It's impossible. A tree is identified by its fruit, by its thoughts, its emotions, and its action. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes, and grapes are never picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. The Bible is saying this, what you and I say, and what we think and what we feel and our actions literally flow from our control center. Have you ever he heard somebody say something and go, I didn't really mean that. I usually go, yes, you really did. Because you said it. Right? That's why it's really good not to say everything you think. <laughs> the Bible functions as a boundary for our minds, our feelings, and our will. So you know, you know the condition of your boundaries and you know what kind of boundaries you have by what comes out of your mouth. If I keep saying yes when I should say no and if I keep saying no when I should say yes, I'm revealing things about my heart. And that's the importance of boundaries. Now in the last two weeks, we've looked at the seven previous laws. The law of sowing and reaping, the law of responsibility, power, respect, motivation, evaluation, and proactivity. Today I want to finish in looking at law 8, 9, and 10. So if you're taking notes, I encourage you to do so. Look at number 8. Would you write in your notes there, the law of envy. The Bible speaks strongly against the heart that envies. Look at James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What is causing the quarrels in the fight among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous or envious of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Now, you might be asking, what does envy have to do with boundaries? Envy is one of the meanest, most selfish, most cruel, most malicious emotion that you have. Why? It's a direct result of the fall. And it was Lucifer's sin that got him banished from heaven. The Bible says that he had the desire to be like the Most High God. If you read the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel. It's in prophetic language, but there's seven times that this entity says, I will ascend above the heavens, and I'm basically going to move from creature to creator. He didn't like his position in life. Lucifer envied God. It turned Lucifer into Satan. Satan then comes, and he tempts Adam and Eve with that jealous seed, envious seed, telling them that they could be like God. They wanted what they did not have, and it destroyed them. Listen to what Clownson and Town, Cloud and Townsend write. This is one of the best things on envy I've ever read. Envy defines good as what I do not possess, and it hates the good that it has. Let that set in. Envy defines good as what I don't have. I wish I had John Nelson's head. <coughs> I love that bald head, <coughs> see? And if I shaved it, I wouldn't look good like you. I'd look like a cue ball. 
So I could be envious of your look. <laughs> How many times have you heard someone subtly put down the accomplishment of others? Somehow robbing them of the goodness that they had attained. And here's the truth. Every one of us at some level has envy. We have that rottedness in our own hearts. But here's what makes envy so destructive. Envy, and I would encourage you to write this one down. Envy guarantees that you will never get what you want. And it actually keeps you perpetually discontented and dissatisfied. I'll say it again. Envy guarantees that you will never get what you want. And it actually keeps us perpetually in a discontented and dissatisfied state. Now, the good news is that the Bible says God wants to give us the desires of our hearts. The problem with envy is this. Envy focuses on what's outside of my boundaries and on what others have. Does that make sense? It's outside of my boundaries. I'd rather have John's head of hair, but I can't. I'll never have it. So envy causes me and puts me into a discontented and dissatisfied state. And let me just go right to the heart of it. If you find yourself consistently discontent, consistently dissatisfied with your spouse, with your kids, with your home, with your work, with your friendships, may I suggest to you that envy is having its way. Because God has intended you and I to be well with our soul. Right? What's wellness of soul? It's contentment. It's satisfaction with what I have, not with what I don't have. When you focus on what others have and have accomplished, you're neglecting your own responsibilities. And you will ultimately have an empty and lonely heart. Look what 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says. True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. <laughs> Isn't that great? True godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. That is why having all these ten boundaries in place are so important. When you operate in the law of sowing and reaping, you're taking responsibility for what you have in life. And by intentionally sowing seeds of faith, friendship, healing, wholeness, restoration, reconciliation, forgiveness, kindness, generosity, sacrifice, patience, vision, and self-control, you plant those seeds, it's going to come back in a rich harvest. See, envy is a self-perpetuating cycle. Why? Because boundaryless people feel empty and unfulfilled. God wants to help you today. If you are constantly running empty and unfulfilled, this is a boundary issue. An envious person looks at another person's fullness and they envy it. Have you ever done that? If you're a wife, you look at some of the husbands and you go, I wish I had one like that. <laughs> if you're a husband, you're looking at another woman and go, whoa, I wish I had one like that. I wish I had a child like that. I wish I had a job like that. I wish I had a car like that. I wish I had a body like that. I wish I had hair like that. You can just go on and on and on. Taking action is the only way out. I can envy and lust after John's head all I want. I'm not going to get anything like that. But I can't take action with mine. Right? I got my hair cut. Don't I look beautiful? <laughs> this engages the law of responsibility, motivation, proactivity, and activity. The Bible says you have not because you don't ask. Did you know you can also envy a person's character and personality? Have you ever done that? Man, I wish I could manage my, my anger like Randy does. You know, I, I, I wish I was more emotionally balanced like Steve was, is. You know, I just wish I had the good looks of Sean. It doesn't take much. You can envy anything. It goes like this. A single person can withdraw from social life when he or she is looking at other 
marriage with other couples and other families and can actually be envious of that. Or play the reverse card. You can be married and you can envy the life of a single person. Because you're sitting there going, oh, the days of freedom. Married people can do this too. We envy each other's spouses. Instead of becoming the spouse God meant us to be. When I'm around husbands that are better husbands than me, I, I, do, I don't get envious of it. I start to ask them, what are you doing? What are you doing? I like what I see in you and go, I can go replicate that myself. And envious heart says, I'm angry that he's better at husbanding or better at husbanding, uh, at parenting or better at pastoring, whatever you're comparing yourself to. What all these people have in common is they refuse to take action themselves, either out of fear or laziness. And then they compare themselves to other and they stay stuck and stay resentful. People with boundaries will question themselves concerning what they don't like about themselves. People with boundaries will say, you know what? I don't like this about myself. I'm going to do something about it. I've dropped 24 pounds in the last six weeks. And the way I've done it, there's no secret. Uh, I can get up to 1,500 calories burned. I have a tech track. So it's a stair stepper. Several of you have actually accidentally walked in when I'm doing it, and you just go, you're crazy. I'm extending profound amount of energy. And then I cut back on what I eat. I'm averaging four to five pounds a week right now. If I change how I'm eating, if I back off of exercise, I will not get the result. So when I see a man who's built really well, I don't envy it. I know what he's had to do to get it, right? And you can sit there and go, well, that's so unfair. You know, it must be his genetics. We blame everything on genetics, don't we? No, it's hard work. It's discipline. It's sacrifice. Would you agree? I was on that stupid thing today at 4.30 in the morning. I had to be, because we had prayer at 7.30. What is it that you're dissatisfied about? God has given you the power to change it. I don't, I don't feel very spiritual. Do you read your Bible every day? No. You can start. Right? What is it you want? Start sowing those seeds, and you'll get a harvest. Number nine, the law of activity. God has created us to be initiators and responders. This is what happened to Adam. He did not initiate. He just sat there passively. One of the main reasons many people, I think, struggle with boundaries is because we lack initiative. Out of fear, out of insecurity, we're expecting somebody to come along and either help us or give us permission. When God says, I've given you the permission, you're created in my image, you take the initiative. And what happens? Initiative always propels us forward. Have you noticed that? Oftentimes, I'll just say to somebody, say, I don't know what to do. Just do something. Well, I don't know what action to take. Just take action. If it's the wrong action, you'll figure it out. Because you'll run into the wall and go, whoa, that's not the action to take. Well, that's okay. Just turn around and go where the wall isn't. If you're here today and you're struggling, I don't know what God wants me to do. What's in your heart? Take action. And then make adjustments. Right? The parable of the five, two, and one talents is a very powerful principle. The first two employers, employees were given money by their boss, and they went out and they invested it, and they made this boss profit. The third employee, because of fear, he, didn't, he hid the money. He didn't invest it. The first two took initiative. They were active. They were assertive. The employee who lost out was passive and inactive. This is really important. The sad thing is many people who are passive it's not that we're inherently evil or bad, but the Bible says that evil is an active force and passivity can become an ally of evil. Best example we have in the Bible is Cain and Abel. God comes to Cain and says, why are you depressed? Why are you angry? He says, you better be careful because sin is crouching at your door. And if you remain passive, 
It's going to eat your lunch. And he remained passive. And what happened? First murder in the Bible. The Bible says we are to push against evil. We're to be active. This is what the Bible calls spiritual warfare. Resist the devil and he'll what? Flee. You got to take the action. That means if I don't resist him, he's allowed to party. At my expense. You must resist. We're to stand against evil and push back through prayer and righteousness and holy living. This is a very important principle, loved ones. Passivity never pays off. And again, uh, Cloud and Townsend in their book on boundaries, which I recommend every one of us read, they write this. God will match our effort, but he will never do our work for us. You, you should write that one down. That is classic. God will match your effort, but loved ones, he will never do the work for you. That would be an invasion of our boundaries. He wants us to be assertive, active, seeking and knocking on the door of life. See, the sin that God rebukes in the story of the talents is not trying and failing, but it's failing to try. Trying and failing and trying again is called what? Learning. Right? In Hebrews 10, 35 and 36, 38 and 39, he says this. So do not throw away this confident trust that you have in the Lord. Remember, the great reward is it brings you patient endurance is what you need now. There's one common theme in people that are usually discontent and dissatisfied. What is it? They're impatient. Right? They put the seed down, they go in the next day, they want to see a full crop. It doesn't happen that way. As my righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure. Now notice this. In anyone who shrinks back and turns away. He says, I do not take pleasure in people who are passive and whine and give up and say it's no use. Hebrews 11, 6. What pleases God? Faith. Taking action in his name. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Passive turning from opportunities. Passive turning from giving. Passive turning from serving and from sacrificing is destructive to our hearts. I don't volunteer and I don't sacrifice and I don't give because I'm a good guy. I know if I don't, my heart will shrivel up. Right? Right? Yeah. That's why we talk so much about giving here. Scott Alvarez is going to speak on it next week. The, the boundary of giving. The giving boundary. And he's not talking about money. Freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely you give. It's the law of sowing and raping. Very powerful. Friends, this is the role of boundaries in our lives. They define and they protect your heart. Remember again our lead verse, Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart above all else. Why? Because it's your control center. And it determines the course of your life. How you guard your heart, how you nurture and protect your heart, basically tells you how your life ends. I'm not a prophet, I'm not a seer, but I can tell you how your life will end. It has everything to do with how you control and guard and nurture your heart. Like the dentist says, don't take care of your teeth and they'll just go away. <laughs> I, I just read a little story recently that was impacting to me. Uh, it has to do with little birds. And when it's time to hatch, if you help a baby out of its egg, you'll kill it. Because the design for that birdie is that it has to peck its way out of the egg into life. This is why codependency is not good. 
because in the name of codependency, we would all help the birds out of the eggshells and we wouldn't have any birds. They'd all be dead, right? right? Because we were so kind to them. It is this aggressive work that strengthens the bird. Loved one, that's how God has made us. If he hatches you and he does his work, your work for you, he invades your boundaries and you'll die. We're not to shrink back. We're not to whine. We're not to mourn. God has called you to the work of your life. He's given you a will to take action. This is why this is such a powerful principle. The principle of activity. And that is this. God says, I'm not going to do for you what you can do. How many of us were so angry with God because we're asking him to do things and he's in heaven saying, that's your job. I can say, make me a better husband. He'll go, that's your job to do that. Well, make me a, I, I, I want to be the best daddy I can. Get books and read. Get around good dads. And then sow seed and go for it. Do you have dreams? I'm just waiting for God to fulfill them. They're not going to happen. Right? They're your dreams. He wants to help you make it. I get a little excited about this. Because I was raised to be very passive. I was raised to blame. I was raised to whine. I was raised to wait around, wait for people to tell me I was okay. And I broke that shell some time ago. And I will never go back to it. It comes from Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Jesus says this. Keep on asking. And you will receive. See, I like this about the NLT. If you read the King James and others, it'll just say, ask. But this is what the Greek tense. It's keep on asking. You don't ask once. You ask until you get what you're asking for. And it could take 10, 15, 20 years. Keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Why? For everyone who asks, receives. Now, you know what a boundaryless, whining person? Well, I've been asking for a day now. And he hasn't answered my prayers. So we come to this brilliant conclusion. He must not exist. Come on. James 5 tells us that Elijah prayed for a long time. And the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person, what? Avails much. Not a five-second prayer. <laughs> everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks find. Everyone who knocks the door will be open. Isn't that great? This is the law of activity. Can I just graciously, kindly say, it's time to get off our butts spiritually. It's time to get active. It's time. Would you agree? This is summertime. It's time. I hope you'll come to the summer, uh, the Alpha course. I hope you'll come to our arts and lyrics. You know, we've got things for you to help your, grow, your faith grow. But if you don't get involved, then it's not going to do anything. You have to take action. Last one is the law of exposure. We've been discussing boundaries functioning. Our, what we're using here is the acronym SURFVIP. S-E-R-F. VIP. S stands for your spiritual life. E stands for your emotional life. R stands for your relational. F is financial. V is vocational. I is intellectual. And P is your physical life. Boundaries define where you begin and where you end. Here's this, the genius about the law of exposure. Your boundaries define who you are in relations to others. The, the idea of boundaries has to do with the fact that we exist in relationships. So what is the law of exposure? The law of exposure means that my boundaries must become visible to you as I communicate them to you. Many of our boundary issues come because of fear, does it not? We're, over we're overwhelmed by guilt, shame, humiliation, not being liked. Loss of love, loss of a connection, afraid somebody's going to be angry at me, on and on and on. God says to us, these are all failures in love. These relationship issues can only be solved 
in relationships. This has a tendency to happen with women, I think, more than men, but we're just as capable. I can't tell you how many times women's come into my office and just said, you know, I just resent that I have to tell him my needs and my desires. He should just know. No, he shouldn't know. Gals, if you haven't figured this out yet, we're not very smart. <laughs> right, Penny? We're not smart. When it comes to our wives, I mean, I, I told Kathy, you need to write the book, you know, how, Marriage for Dummies. And I find that we do better when she can make, expose to me, make audible what her needs are. So I've learned to ask her, what did you need me to say instead of what I said? How would you like me to say it? What kind of tone should I say it in? You want me to touch you. How do I touch you? In what way? And as she gets more specific, then I can give her what she's asked for. And when I give her what she asked for, she's happy. And when she's happy, I'm happy. <laughs> would you agree? And vice versa. I have to make sure I articulate my boundaries to her. I remember when we were first married, she said, I want you to look me in the eyes and sing me a love song. I looked at her and said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, that, that just isn't going to happen. Why? Didn't, I didn't love her? No, I was too scared. I was too scared to look her in the eyes and sing a love song. It came about 15 years later. I made it. But I was frightened. When our boundaries are unexpressed, our relationships suffer. So here's the important boundary lesson. Boundaries exist and they will affect us whether or not we communicate them. If our boundaries are not com communicated and they're not exposed directly, they will be communicated indirectly or through manipulation. So let me just give us a, a, this is the cliff notes of this thing. If you're somebody who's hurt a lot, if you're somebody who's highly insensitive and you're consistently getting your feelings hurt, you know what that is? That's a boundary issue. You are not articulating your boundaries well enough and you're expecting everybody to be able to guess what they are. It's not gonna happen. One of the best Examples of this is Ephesians 4, 25 to 27. Paul, how's this for articulating boundaries? Stop telling lies. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Anything that's not truthful is a lie. Stop it. <laughs> Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. How's that for clear boundaries? So Kathy and I are doing some things to, to try to practice this more. How can we go to bed and make sure that we're bonded and we love each other and we're together and we're not, one of us isn't going to bed with resentment and bitterness towards the other person. Because you know what happens when we do that? Who jumps in bed with us? Satan. Satan does. You give him a place. He doesn't belong in your bed. Right? I don't want him in my bed. You want that ugly thing in your bed? No, of course not. Boundaries. The Bible speaks of walking intentionally in the light of God's word. Look at this one in Ephesians 5, 13 and 14. But their evil tensions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. I want to encourage you today. First of all, if you're here and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, your life is enshrouded in the darkness. You want to become a person of light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with Jesus and his blood cleanses us from all sin. How do you get into the light of God? You confess your sins and you surrender and submit your life to God. So as we go to prayer, 
what is the action step you need to take about the law of envy? If you find yourself envious and coveting of other people, you need to start taking action. Whatever you see somebody else has, you can have it too. But don't steal it. Did you know that's what adultery is? Adultery is just breaking boundaries and you're going, I don't like what I have, so I'm going to steal somebody else's. The Bible says you cannot take fire into your bosom and not be burned. You take somebody's husband, you take somebody's wife, you are messing your life up. So he says, have the kind of marriage you want. Be that husband, be that wife. Law of activity. What actions do you need to take? Law of exposure. If you're struggling with any personal relationships, I can guarantee you what's at the core of it is you haven't made your boundaries visible. And God wants you to do that. Let's pray. Lord, we're just so grateful for your word. We thank you that it's so practical. We thank you, Lord, that you've designed us in such a way that as we walk in the light, as you're in, in, as you're in the light, we actually have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with you. We have a relationship, life-giving relationship. Lord, I just love these people. I love this church and our community so much. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us to put into practice your truth. Help us to do away with passivity and to be active. Active spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, vocationally, intellectually, and physically. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.